We're live from Las Vegas celebrating 10 years of reInvent. I'm Rudy Chetty. Security, simulation, streaming, oh my. Bill Vass, VP of Technology and Engineering at AWS, loves large scale problems. Corey Quinn sits down with Bill. Let's take a listen. Welcome to Opinions My Own. I'm Corey Quinn, Chief Cloud Economist at the Duckbill Group. Today, I'm talking to Bill Vass. Bill, hey. you're the VP of Technology at AWS, which is only slightly less vague than I work on computers. Yeah. What exactly do you do? Well, so all of the folks that uh, are VPs are VPs of technology. So our, our team runs quantum computing, gaming, rendering, autonomous systems, robotics, uh, to uh, high performance storage systems. Um, we used to just recently move streaming out of our team, but we ran streaming before that. And at some point in time, a lot of other services, messaging, other stuff were on our team. But we also still run uh, uh, also things like system manager and all the automation, CloudWatch, those components as well. The edge components like Snowball and those kinds of things. And of course, IoT, which kind of brings together everything uh, across the board. Um, so, and geospatial services too. So it's, it's a pretty broad portfolio, a lot of interesting things. My background, former CIO, so I care a lot about like plumbing services. I care a lot about governance and you know management and those kinds of things. A lot of things that you care about as well. Uh, but I also, from like my time at the Pentagon and being CIO and CTO and other things there, I, I also work a lot on emerging technologies like quantum computing, robotics, and autonomous systems. And I have a background in that as well. So it's I kind of have those two parts, but they all kind of come together. And we'll be to see some interesting things where the management systems being able to manage a common view across both. So there's a longer term picture. There's a longer term picture and a common thread that ties yes. these all together. It wasn't that, okay, whose responsibility is this? And you missed a very critical meeting, so, oh, Bill's going to handle it. And yeah. It's yeah. a grab bag of uh, unwanted children on some level. It's certainly not that. <laughs> it's, it, it's some of the most important services. Just like, I mean, there's so many important services uh, uh, across AWS, but, the, you know, like uh, uh, just CloudWatch, for example, is heavily used, as you know, and these area system manager manages uh, millions and millions of instances for customers and all uh, areas, you know, all the file services are growing like crazy, all the transport services, you know, we've got snowballs deployed all over the world. Uh, we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of robots that are, you know, being run in the data center. I mean, in the fulfillment centers, we've got uh, robots, uh, you know, deployed with customers all over the world. We've got almost every connected car connects in through our IoT. Billions of IoT devices connect in through our IoT products. So, um, and of course, all of that streams in and all of that ends up on storage, right? And then simulation for compute and other things at the back end. Um, uh, and discrete modeling and predictive. And then uh, as you move into quantum computing, that'll do a lot more predictive analytics and also material sciences and things like that that we're pretty excited about as well. And then in addition to that, my normal job, I also am the exec sponsor for three verticals for intelligence uh, and defense because I was you know, one of the CIOs of the Pentagon and, and, and Army um, for uh, automotive because I'm a motorhead and I like cars and I like the, that, that industry a lot uh, and uh, oil and gas and energy. Uh, and surprisingly, those are very similar domains. A lot of people don't think of it that way, but they all have edge computing requirements, IoT requirements. They all do life safety level. They all care a lot about security. They need high performance computing. They do simulations at very large scale. Um, so it's very similar in many ways. They all have autonomous systems. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how common they are uh, and the common challenges across those domains. And that's kind of why I like them. There's a lot of emerging stuff that you mm -hmm. have had your hands pretty deeply into. Yes. A lot of the quantum computing stuff that emerges, for example. That's I, right. I tried to go through the quick start tutorial, and you wound up displaying an application for a PhD program uh -huh. at a variety of different <laughs> universities, depending <laughs> upon which one is partnering with you in which geo. Yeah. That's great, but on some level, it's one of those areas where I need to throw my hand up and say, ah, my brain is full. Can, how, yeah. do, how did someone get so, started with this so, without a so, deep math background? So, so Bracket, um, which is Bracket, which my wife always tells me I'm misspelling the word bracket, but it, bracket is the uh, quantum, Dirac's quantum notation is where that comes from. Uh, we tried to find a name, talking about naming, uh, that didn't have a Q in it for quantum computing. So, so it's a, a, a pretty good name from my, my perspective. But uh, it allows you to just use a simple Jupyter notebook to go through and build these quantum circuits. Now, understanding the math behind the quantum circuits, you got me there. That is a hard, that's a hard problem. And I think ultimately, you know, James Gosling, who invented Java, is on our team as well. 
and we're talking about ways perhaps to make that uh, uh, more of like a JVM or a CUDA kind of equivalent to make it so uh, uh, more, more programmers can use it more pervasively. But uh, you're also seeing this deployment of hybrid jobs as well. And I, I'm pretty excited about some of this. I remember, uh, of course, my kids, you know, they, 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 they may or may not remember this, but uh, at one point in time, we had three different quantum computers or three different technologies plus EC2 passing variables back before, between each other in one application. First time ever in history that's happened. And I texted my kids and just remember this first time in history. So, you know, when, when you're old you can, and you have a quantum computer in your house, you can remember. <laughs> this day, but uh, it, it, it's a pretty exciting emerging field. There's a lot to be done there and a lot of challenges there, a lot of material science challenges there, a lot of computing uh, science and computer science challenges there. Um, you know, the, the fabrication facilities are pretty amazing. You know, some of them are, have to be done in a full vacuum. If you can imagine, you've seen those big fabs, imagine in a vacuum. So it looks like a submarine with portals in it. And a, over so a there's actually line, a so. facility where these things run and there's a button labeled turn on the suck and then it suddenly starts sucking in the good way uh, yeah. and now the, this magic starts working. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's fascinating when you go to our, our quantum facility and I'll, I'll show you some pictures later. It's, it's pretty exciting down there uh, in Caltech. And there's just, you know, floors and floors of, of buildings of these uh, different types of fabs uh, to handle this. There are two nanometer fabs, for, you know, and, and uh, we, we produce quite a number of chips now. We've got many machines running. And the thing that's exciting to me, too, is you see those, you know, the chandeliers you see with the, the quantum computers. They're, they're like uh, uh, punk, steampunk art in some ways to me. They're just Yeah, I keep gorgeous. looking at them, and is it, it almost looks biological in some ways. Like, I'm going to pop it open and find a dinosaur embryo inside. Yeah, yeah, they're actually not, I mean, they, they, they look complicated, but in reality, there's the, the tubes you see are two things. They're the cooling tubes for the cryogenics and the layers you see in those chandeliers, each are a colder and colder layer down to here where the chip is, where the real quantum computer is. And then uh, the, the other tubes you see that are all spiraling everywhere, uh, those are actually uh, microwave waveguides. They're a little hollow tubes, right? They're not actually wires, but you think of them as wires. And those are the control systems to control the chip and the qubits on the chip. And they get go through filtering systems that get smaller and smaller. And they're setting up uh, uh, entanglement on the chip, which is how the circuits are built, uh, which is a fascinating thing to, in, in a lot of ways. And those are running, you know, like I said, the coldest place in the universe at, that we know, of, unless there's some other alien civilization that's doing it because there's no natural cold that cold. Well, there is the social right media there. response I get from brand accounts, but that's a slightly different type of <laughs> yeah, chill. Yeah, that's a little different type of chill. That's not quite, that's not, not quite at micro Kelvin, though, you know, I wouldn't think. What's really struck me as I look back at the last decade or so that I've mm -hmm. spent making terrible technology decisions in the world of AWS. Yeah. That's a wonderful database, let's misuse it as a DNS server, yeah. or vice versa. Is the sheer scale of it is something I don't think most people can wrap their heads around yeah. because they're going to set up an account and I'm going to spin up some instances and it'll let me spin up five or ten and then I'll hit a limit and oh, that must be as big as it's supposed to get. Yeah. Turns out, no, you can go significantly larger once there are some very well-intended and useful safeguards yeah. removed from an account. This yes. is beyond the scale of any one company in any environment I've it's ever true. seen other than large cloud providers. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. In fact, we're at a point now where we're exceeding the government, right, which was, you know, I, when I ran the, the, the data centers in the government, when I first came to AWS, they were bigger, not anymore. Um, and so that's a fascinating thing for me to kind of watch us. And that also means we have experience at scale that no one else has experienced before either. Uh, and, and that's pretty challenging. That's part of what I love about the job, actually, is I've always loved very large scale uh, uh, compute problems, very large scale storage problems. You know, like I said, at one time S3 was on my team, and that's pretty fascinating to see how that continues to grow. Uh, it's great to see the file systems growing at a tremendous rate right now, and they've gotten to be, be very, very large. It's, Fascinating to me to see custom companies moving petabytes and, and now exabytes into the cloud, and it, it's only a matter of time to, to get to zettabyte levels, right? And so, which was kind of a joke at one point in time. When I worked at Sun Microsystems, we worked on CFS, and it was, I remember uh, uh, some of the PEs at the time calculating that, that if you actually stored that much data, it would boil the ocean, right? But, you know, we're way past that. You know, at the same time, it was like, you'll never have anything faster than DSL at your house, right? You know, there's, you know, the, so, so things, Things do, th these limits do get 
you know, uh, superseded on a regular basis as, you know, the famous quote was it from Bill, Bill Gates, you know, no one needs more than 4K, right? And so, yeah, you know, and we're all walking around now with supercomputers in our pocket connected to the sum total of human knowledge. Right. And some of the services under your purview speak directly to things like that. Yes. Amazon yeah. location service is a great yeah. example. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example. So that's a very exciting space as you, but there's also another area where you start to see the real world and the virtual world start to come together in that space as you, as you look at 3D. A spatial computing and 3D mapping comes online in the future, along with um, you know all of the, the the current spatial services that we have, and then you connect that in with the stuff we're doing in Kuiper and the satellite systems and ground station and other things like that, along with IoT being able to see where everything is all the time. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a, a fun, exciting new world. One of the challenges I have, particularly with the products that are under your purview, mm. is you talk about S3. Yes, I can wrap my head around it, kind of. You talk about EFS. Oh, mm. a file system. It's, it's NFS only for cloud. Right. Great, I can work with that. Yeah. And then you start talking about industrial IoT, and I look around at the 10,000 robots I don't have, and as far as management problems yeah. go, and then you start talking about talking to satellites in orbit, and with any other company, you're going to see this through a lens of, well, they're clearly not focused on my problems right. and my needs. But Amazon has always been one of those companies that is almost a microservices-oriented yeah. company where you really can walk and chew gum at the same time. Do you find that that is a common misunderstanding when you're talking to particularly customers new to cloud? Um, not necessarily. I mean, the, the, the reality is we're not focused on what they're focused on yet. Right. I mean, look look at the, how the transformations have occurred, like with Uber and Lyft in the transport industry. Right. Look at the things that have happened in the streaming, you know, uh, uh, industry for streaming video and movies, and how that's transformed things. Um, and so, you know, to think that any company that has something they make that won't be connected to a network over time, or logistics, or any of those kinds of things, and won't need satellite communications, they're living in the dark ages. And so that will become very, very important to them in the future. And it's our job to kind of understand that future and build that, right? Build towards the future. And we won't always be right as we build the future. But um, it, it, we need to make sure as we're looking, when we listen to our customers, we're hearing not just what they need today, but what they need in the future. I mean, nobody came to us and said, I want uh, an Echo device, right? Uh, uh, but we had this concept that, you know, wouldn't it be nice, you know, every customer would want this idea. Yeah, you it's a robot in your house. You could talk to it. And, okay, and, what's it look like? Ah, about a smaller paper towel roll. And yeah, yeah. I have a hard time envisioning anyone asking for that. Yeah, yeah, and so it's, but even you know things like the Amazon Go stores, if you've experienced that, it's a, it's a transformational experience, but people didn't ask for that explicitly, right? And so uh, a lot of these innovations, but I mean, people didn't ask for an iPhone. Uh, at least two services under your purview, and I'm sure there are more. Yeah. Systems Manager yeah. and CloudWatch. Yes. Both of those started life as services that were focused, as best I can tell, completely on EC2 instances. Uh -huh. And in the fullness of time, you can now use them to manage things Everything. that don't live anywhere near AWS. Yeah. On-prem, for example. Yeah, right. Was that a dawning awareness that, hey, we can extend this beyond our borders? Was it a light switch moment, or was it always planned that way? It was always planned that way. So it's so about three years ago, uh, we started extend, extending the agents to run anywhere. Uh, and so if you put the system manager, CloudWatch manager, we also extended uh, CloudFormation, so I used to have that on my team. So it will run anywhere as well. So you can deploy a CloudFormation template with the, the resources you defined on-prem if you want, or other places as well, right? Um, and um, uh, these services allow you to have the ability to, to, once you learn that service, you don't have to relearn it for other locations. Um, it also, a lot of CIOs like to see sort of that combined view. I know you've made fun of the single pane of glass in, in the well, past. Well, I make fun of many things, things so please, things, that is so, one of them, but I, yes. I know, I know, but I, I think that a lot of CIOs like to see, uh, don't like to log into 40 different things when they've got 40 different infrastructures, right? Um, and the ability to have it all in one place and manage it in one place and ensure that it's patched. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that our team does, you know, based on, back on my, my CIO point of view rather than my emerging technology point of view. Like one of my favorite things is conformance packs, and a lot of people don't know about that, but it's magical. It's the most magical thing, I think, in, almost in some ways. And I know I do quantum computing too, but conformance packs. Basically, when I was a CIO, I had 80 people doing compliance, right? And 
So what we did is we said, and let's, three more phoning it in, but yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, here yeah, nor yeah, there. But, but, but yeah. I said, let's automate compliance, right? And conformance backs, you just go into org and you say, for these accounts, I want to be HIPAA and GDPR and PCI or whatever I want. I just go click, 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 and it enforces it, right? And you're done. And then when the auditor comes and says, I want to see your PCI audit, you just click a button, it generates PCI audit, and you say, here. That's a magical thing for a CIO because you don't have to spend all those people, all those resources. You know, compliance is immensely important. You lose your job if you don't meet your compliance, right? But, I used to work in a regulated industry. Right, and I right. found this I, the yeah. wrong way where right. I'm go I'd come from data center land. Right, oh, right. I'm going to answer the audit form right. like I would in an on-prem environment. Right, and right. of course then someone comes in and tries to get a tour of US East One. Right. It turns out there are better ways to get there. Right. You are better as yeah. an as a corporate entity at speaking yeah. the language auditors want to hear right. than I'm going to be. So things like conformance packs are one way to get yeah. there. I'm a huge fan of AWS Artifact in the yeah. same direction. It's yeah. take all the documentation that you Right. teams have laboriously prepared and hand them to people, right. that'll keep them busy for a while so I can go back to building things. Right, exactly. So you can focus on building things. I, and that, that's really focus on delivery, innovation for your customer. So you automate that, that those, those kinds of tasks. Now, um, but compliance still continues to be incredibly important and that's one of those things that, that, you, that you do. And that, that is, in some ways, as exciting to me as you know, uh, you know, logical qubits we're building, our cat qubits, or, or the things we're doing you know, in the metaverse space, or the things we're doing uh, uh, at the edge, and you know, autonomous driving, and those kinds of things. They're all pretty interesting in different ways, but in the end, they kind of all overlap too, because you'll, you need, you're gonna need to do uh, compliance on what you put in a car. You're going to need to do compliance on what you put uh, in an industrial setting. You're going to need to do compliance on all those things. And the same level of security and requirements are all there. So it kind of does all overlap. And uh, this idea of being able to manage it all from one place, see the compliance from all in one place, make sure it's backed up from all the one place, and all those kinds of things uh, are just the things that make CIOs' lives easier and CTOs' and CEOs' lives easier and board of directors too, because you know the, the section tens on, on boards, they have to make sure that all these things, you know, Sarbanes Oxley and other things like that, have to get done. So, and those you don't want to rubber stamp something that has the potential of personal penalties tied yeah, to right, it. Exactly. The general rule. It, it, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so, so to me, those are just as magical as you know the magic of S3, where it's infinite scale, or the you know the amazing performance we, we see in our HPC storage with FSX, or. Uh, the latest graviton processors, or, or you know, the the qubits, or, or or our latest game engine, or the, the latest thing coming out of RoboMaker, right? Th those are all 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 fascinating to me. Or, you know, at one point in time, QLDB was on our team, uh, and and I worked to sort of bring that into production. You use the quantum we, name for the wrong service uh, on that, some that, level. That, so, so that that's a, that's one of those things where I I prefer them not to have used that name, but I wasn't <laughs> in that naming meeting. <laughs> It was about quanta of data, not mm. uh, not not quantum computing. Just just to be clear, just to <laughs> clarify that. Uh, and so, um, but a lot of people don't realize QLDB is how AWS runs, right? It is the underpinnings for this distributed compute and distributed decision making that you can make, along with this high performance log based storage uh, that's super durable. And and for companies that understand it, it's transformational, right? It, it, it's an amazing thing. Um, and you know, I love that kind of plumbing too. So that's the, you know, I, the, at one point in time, I had uh, all the messaging services on my team, and and worked heavily on getting you know FIFO implemented in in, in SQ, SQS. And that's a hard thing to do at our scale, right? When you've got things that are running to billions of transactions. When an AWS service is launched, it's mm -hmm. fairly close to a minimum viable product, mm -hmm. where it's you have minimal built, lovable, lovable product. Minimum lovable product. We'll okay, go yeah. with that. <laughs> right, yes, yeah. it's. <laughs> we'll accept that. Okay, all right. And okay, now it, it is what is going to happen next is going to be defined by how customers use it. Right. And sure, it might not be feature complete. There may be a typo in the console yeah. or something like that. Now, one of the challenges that I see is that the first time someone experiences something new, yeah. well, now they understand how it works and they now know things about it. Yeah. And they never bother to go back a year right. later and are the things that I know still up to date? Yeah. And it's, services across the board come a long way they from do. where in, they are in a year. In a year, it's amazing number of changes, right? And so, so I would always encourage people to, you know, it, it, it's it, in a year we will have launched 
you know, thousands of changes to something uh, uh, and improvements across the board based on customer feedback. And we're constantly, so we, we have this very high bar for operational excellence and security at launch, right? And those are the things we do not compromise on. But yeah. it's, it's neat, this continual evolution yeah. of what, of how you can contextualize something like AWS yeah. and then see that continually being challenged. I, I worry what would have happened if I had, instead of continuing to explore deeper, gone back into an on-prem environment for five years and then coming back to this, it almost would have been an entirely new industry. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it, it would have changed so much in five years, you, you, know, you wouldn't have recognized it. It's, you know, they still would be the core services, you know, EC2, S3, you know, identity management, you know, the, all the cloud watch, those core services there, but, you know, the, the amount of evolution and expansion. The other thing, too, you're seeing a lot is our expanding to the edge in a big way, right? And, and customers really want that, you know, centralized control and decentralized execution, a kind of seamless set of APIs from the edge to the cloud. And so green grass and, and uh, the ability to run Lambda and containers on green grass on the devices and on the edges and, you know, the things you're seeing with uh, wavelength and the outpost components there and the snowballs and all of that be forms a, a cloud continuum, if you like, from the edge to the cloud, uh, local zones, all of those kinds of things uh, are, are, are doing there. So I'm, I'm pretty excited how that is going as well. It's interesting to me to see, I don't want to say they're necessi necessarily hand in glove, mm -hmm. but they definitely seem to rhyme. Uh, a few weeks before reInvent, yeah. the retail division wound up releasing an air quality sensor uh -huh. for Echo devices. Right. And of course I pre-ordered one day off, because why not? Yeah. And But I'm curious to how, was there any alignment between the industrial IoT stuff that yeah, you're working on in AWS? Yeah, very much. So, so, so we work really closely. I mean, a lot of, you think about, it's fascinating. The thing about working with AWS in this industrial space uh, is we've had to do it all for ourselves and we've done it for decades, right? When you think autonomous systems, robotics, IoT, devices, end devices, sensors, large scale logistics, you know, fulfillment centers, manufacturing, we've been doing that for, you know, two decades. And so that gives us a unique advantage the other cloud providers don't have because we have to make it work for ourselves first. And a lot of times the products that you see, and that's where AWS came from, is basically we take something we know people need because we're using it ourselves uh, to run our infrastructure at massive scale and we generalize it and turn it into an external product. So RoboMaker, for example, you know, there's going to be lots of robots in the world. Those robots are going to be connected to networks. They're going to be extended into a cloud. Uh, writing robotics code is hard. Uh, we wanted to make it easy, and we had experimentation of doing it, understanding and doing it uh, from doing it in our fulfillment centers and doing it for Prime Air and doing it for, you know, you see the Scout vehicles and now Astro and other things like that. So we already had to do it for ourselves. So we took the best of all that, generalized it, and put it into RoboMaker. Uh, and that allows people to then quickly develop robots, run them in a simulated environment, train them, and then deploy the code onto the robots, right? Uh, that's a hard thing to do yourself. Doing it in RoboMaker tremendously accelerates your development, right? Um, you know, we do the same thing, you know, building a game is hard. So we've created a game engine uh, uh, called O3DE that we've open sourced uh, with the Linux Foundation and that makes it easier to build your own game engine and, and, and build on top of that. Nimble Studio, it's hard to set up a studio and manage all the desktops and all these other things. Click a button, deploy a studio in the cloud, uh, work through it, get it set up. Uh, we continue to evolve that as well. Um, you know, in those spaces. And, and then, of course, this, you know, doing what we launched with RoboMaker on the 18th of October enables this autonomous driving capability and drone training, all these other kinds of things in a few easy steps, right? So you no longer have to manage a bunch of servers and spawn them out. It'll do that for you, which is all part of this, you know, 3D spatial computing that we're working on. Bill, I want to thank you for being so patient and suffering the slings and arrows I'm hurling <laughs> in your direction. I really do appreciate how generous you're being with your time. Yeah, well, thank you again. I mean, you know, the, you're heavily read within a AWS, uh, and we take everything you say to heart. Uh, I will be and, completely insufferable from this point <laughs> forward. You thought I was bad uh, before. Right, right. So, so it's, it's, it's very important. Thank you for your feedback. I know you're an advocate for our customers, and that's really important to me. Of course, thank you. I'm Corey Quinn, Chief Cloud Economist at the Duckbill Group. This has been Opinions My Own with my guest, Bill Vass, 
VP of Technology at AWS, and of course, the ultimate AWS bill. Pony Bull could help us automate our lives. I'm Rudy Chetty, you're watching Live from reInvent.